Welcome back, everyone. A contentious debate growing in this city and around the country right now over the issue of gun violence. An 8% spike in shootings here in New York City has many people questioning whether the controversial policy of stop and frisk should have been suspended. It was suspended now about one year ago. So let's discuss this issue. Let's debate it. Lou Palumbo, retired law enforcement agent, is here with us. Also, Mark Lamont Hill, CNN political commentator and host of Huff Post Live. All right, guys. In 15 seconds or less, I want to lay down the parameters of where this discussion is going because I think you guys have diametrically opposed views on stop and frisk. It's been a year now since it was suspended, Lou. We've seen this spike, this rise in shootings this year. Stop and frisk, the lack of it, is it responsible for that spike? Most definitely. I mean, unfortunately, stop and frisk is a very necessary tool in eliminating firearms or handguns or whatever form of weapon they're using in the street. All right, stop right there. Mark Lamont Hill, the spike in shootings that we've seen. Would it have been lower with stop and frisk? First, I, I, I would dispute the idea that it's a spike. 8% is an increase. A spike is a bit much. Um, we don't know yet. Even the NYPD says we don't know. We have to unpack the data and figure out whether or not uh, the, the eliminating uh, stop and frisk is the cause of this. I know in 2013 there was a 50% decrease in stop and frisk policies and a 25% drop, drop in crime. And no one was saying, oh, stop and frisk, getting rid of stop and frisk is working. So I think there are a variety of factors we have to consider here. So, Mar uh, Lou, what about that? The numbers Mark's talking about here, we have seen an 8% rise, maybe, maybe not. Not a spike, but a rise in shootings. Still, the second lowest number of shootings, I think, you know, on record here in the city. It, it, you know, if the question is, is there a correlation between the increase in shootings and the abandonment of the stop and frisk policy, the answer unequivocally is yes. It takes a little bit of time. Until That's based on what? Based on what? It, it's based on experience, and I'm going to re make reference specifically for you, Mark. When Bill Bratton first came into his uh, job as police commissioner approximately 20 years ago, we had over 2,200 homicides in this city every year. Stop and frisk was one of the most effective tools that was implemented. We reduced the homicides to approximately 500. You cannot arbitrate that, Mark. That is a statistical truth. It takes a little bit of time until it filters through the street that the police are in the hands-off mode. And that's why there's a little bit of lag time that occurs between 2013 and present time and why suddenly the increase is starting to take effect. The simple truth of the, of the matter is, is that the individuals that carry out these acts with firearms realize now that the police have been instructed to lay off. They have no fear or reticence about carrying weapons. Before, when they implemented the stop and frisk, stop, question and frisk, they realized that there was a high likelihood that they were going to be found out if they were to carry weapons. <laughs> well, okay, okay, so first, there wasn't a high likelihood. 89% of the time when they pulled, when they stopped someone and frisked them, they, 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 they were found innocent of, 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 of everything, right? Not just guns, but also drugs and other activity. So in general, I don't think... What time frame are you uh, speaking to, Mark? What uh, time frame? Well, if you look at, if you look at NY, NYPD data from 2000 until even last year, uh, the, the, low, the most successful rate police had was something like uh, in Mark, the 80s. And, the, and the reason, and the reason... Well, but let me, let me, you've made a series of arguments. I'm Mark, just going to follow ahead, ahead, buddy. So, so one, another point here is that it doesn't work, right? Again, it, just statistically, it does not work. We have found effectively that most people who are stopped don't have anything. So if somehow these people with guns are thinking that the police have a high likelihood of finding them, the data doesn't bear that out. Uh, but, but there's a whole other range of reasons why this is also problematic. One, I think you, you're saying that there's stati unequivocal statistical evidence, but then you're saying this is based on experience. If you look at... Uh, uh, the range of statistical factors that go into this, it's not just stop and frisk, it's community policing, it's high engagement, it's, it's, having, it's targeting populations who may be more likely to be engaged in criminal behavior. All that stuff matters. Simply taking a whole bunch of people and pulling them over or stopping them and frisking them Mark, doesn't seem to work. You're right, about, you're right about that, my friend. But the, the reality of the situation is this. You're speaking current time, and I'm speaking not just currently, but over a span of over 20 years. But I do agree with you. There yeah, but are that wasn't the thing that happened over 20 years. It wasn't as if there, was all these, there were all these guns and crime, and suddenly we stopped and pulled everyone over, and suddenly crime went down. But even if that were true... That's what happened, Mark. No, a range of things happened. Well, it wasn't are you just stopping frisk. Are you telling me the only thing that New York police minute, did was stop and frisk people? I'd like if, to think you engaged in community policing. They, like they, they, they did, but there is no substitute for stopping and frisking people if you're looking for guns. And if you're asking me... Of course. And if I were to stop every American on the street arbitrarily, I probably would find some guns. And at some point, it would reduce crime. But, but that's not... First of all, it violates the Fourth Amendment. But, but beyond that, it, it's not the most effective way... Mark, it isn't the only tool. You're 100% right. I agree tool. with you. Luke, well, I would, argue, I would argue that with you. And the statistics that existed 20 years ago when you were a young man support the fact 
that stop and frisk is effective in getting guns off the street. What we're experiencing now is an increase in shootings and weapons on the street because the police have been told to lay off. And the element in the society and our culture that carry firearms are not fearful anymore. And that's <laughs> they were never reality. fearful because of the evidence. 20 years no, ago. No, no, they, they were fearful, Mark. And that's supported by the fact that the homicides dropped from 2,200 to 500. Let's, yes, that's, that's, that's absolutely not true. Even 20 years, years ago when you were a younger man, it, it, that was, it wasn't the case. <laughs> you are both young men, yes, although correct. we're both growing older by the second here as we continue to debate this. Look, by the end of the summer, we'll have some more statistics here. Let's hope they're not bad statistics one way or the other. But we'll keep watching this. The police say they're watching. They're putting 400 cops on the street, taking them behind the de out from behind the desk, put them on the street. Hopefully that will do something in and of itself. Thanks, guys. We'll see. Kate? Okay.